in this time when folks have become so busy that we don't have time for God like we ought to have. Sometimes I find myself busy at the end of the day have not given the time I needed to, to to my devotion. And I can just see so many others constantly being caught up in things that takes us away from our devotion with God. I don't think we realize the commitment that we like to commit to the Lord. I always look at it like this, the percentage. And when we look at our percentage, that's what they usually do business by percentage. Basketball, want to know how many percentage shots. What's your percentage on your three-point shooting, foul shooting? And you judge by that and determine how well you're doing by your percentage. Amen? I'm going to ask you, in the percentage of the times we have dedicated to go before the Lord, especially I just use Sunday as an example. Amen. In the month's time, that will give us four Sundays. Is that right? Most of the time, four Sundays. And if you stay out two, two Sundays out of the month, what that make you? 50%. Fifty percent. If you stay out just one Sunday a month, what that make you? Seventy-five. Can I ask you another question? We got retailers over here, you boss ladies. If somebody that's supposed to be there one hundred percent of the time, you allotted them, and Javon, they only come seventy-five percent of the time. What do you think is going to happen to them? They're going to be terminated. Would you concur with her? You would fight them? I wonder, do we take seriously our commitments to the things of God that way? If a natural person, a natural business lady, a gentleman is saying, you know, we can't use you even though you got talent, you got gift, you have ability. One thing you don't have is availability. Amen? You're not available. I can't use you. Amen. I believe that God is getting ready to do something great in the midst of his people. But we have to sacrifice sometime. We have to make ourselves available for God to use us. Does that make sense? It's my responsibility to give you fair warning. And I believe these scientists, NASA has said that we're facing full blood moons in the next 18 months four blood moons and right in the middle of it is a solar eclipse as well this is what science is telling us let's look at these things and see is there any other evidence let's start with our first scripture it's going to be exodus to 12th chapter verses 12 through 13 12 and 13 <coughs> read for us minister sofas I want you to get this scripture up front. So when we began to go into the scriptures to establish the reason for the blood moons, that we that are in the house of God need to know that if we are under the blood, then we're going to be all right. Does that make sense? That God has not appointed us to wrath, but salvation through Jesus Christ. 
But he says in here, he says, whenever he sees the blood applied upon our lives, amen, that means we have to walk constantly in right fellowship with God. You got to always be so this time will not catch us unaware. Amen. We'll be all right if we do that. The last week we talked briefly about the common full blood moons. I think we all can agree that they are some kind of a sign or heavenly message, especially seeing the time in which they are appearing. Amen. The time in which they are appearing, I want you to, I'll get to that in a minute, but I want you to just see a little bit of what God says about the signs that he has set in the heavens. In first Genesis, the first chapter, verses five, 1 through 5, and verse 14. Follow me here. <coughs> Read. Let them be also for what? Signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. In addition to days and years and season, the lights can also be for what? Signs. They also can be used for signs. So God, he will use his heaven as a billboard to post messages periodically. He posts it up, and he wants us to notice, and as I said earlier, you don't usually post messages unless it's a season for it to take notice. When an event is getting ready to happen, you'll post the message then to prepare the people for the time or for the event. The full blood moons. Scientists has concluded that in the last 2,000 years, there has been only for eight blood moons. And each time it was a sign foretelling some great event. We talked about last week that the first blood moon, uh, it was uh, actually the last blood moon was in 1967. And that was during the Six Day War. <clears throat> and most of the time when there's a blood moon, God is either bringing judgment upon Israel or upon the world. It has been connected to judgment. When we go through these scriptures today, you're going to find out every one of them was foretelling some sort of judgment that God was getting ready to do. But I thank God that he's warning us and giving us enough time to do something about it. Some of you will continue to be asleep, and when the service is over and amen has been given and the benediction, you will still be in that slumber. You have not taken the word of God seriously enough to start preparing yourself to be in a place of safety when this stuff started to happen. Amen. So it's my responsibility to continue to, to warn you that this represents something. Amen. And so in this we see here that God has always given us a sign of what was taking place. Amen. The Six Day War was when... Israel took control, the Jewish people took control of Jerusalem for the first time in over 3,000 years. The next one prior to that, I say it was in 1967, excuse me, 48. And this was a time when Israel became a state again. And it had been destroyed and lost its statehood way back in Babylonian time. Today, in the span of 18 months, from April 15th, that's just a few days away. That's just a few days away, April 15th through 2014 to September 28, 2015, there will be four blood moons and one solar eclipse. The dates of that is going to fall on, as I said, April 15, 2014. This is during the season of what, church? Passover. The next one 
is October in this year, October the 8th, 2014. This is during the season of what? Feast of Tabernacles. And right in the middle is going to be a solar eclipse. And this is supposed to be, according to scientists, NASA, this is going to be March the 20th, 2015. And then we go down to April again, doing Passover again. April the 4th, 2015, it's going to be another blood moon. And this is going to be during the Passover season. And the last one is going to be September the 28th, 2015. And this is during the season of the Feast of Tabernacle. There are books that's already in print about these four blood moons. I heard Pastor John Hagee talking about, he had a book out. Others have books proclaiming this to be a sign to the church and to the earth. Many theologians have different opinions about what's going on at this time. So let us look at the Bible and see if there were such events in the past that we can at least know what's taking place in our time. For I started looking and doing research and I started with Isaiah to Revelation. And I gave an account of several blood moons during this time. And so we're going to go to Isaiah, the 13th chapter. And for, to expedite time, I'm going to start at verse 9. But you can write it down. The, the whole context of this statement that is made at the end is Isaiah, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 11. But we're going to just start at verse 19 through 11. Amen? And look what it says. Behold, the day of the Lord coming, cruel both with wrath and furious anger, to lay the land desolate. He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of the land. He's going to do what? Destroy the sinners out of the land. For the stars of heaven and the constellation thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in its going forth, and the moon shall not cease her light to shine, not, shall not cause her light to shine. Amen. You can let them in, brother. We see here that God is saying to, that, 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 that when the moon began to show forth signs, and the sun began to show forth signs, in this context that the anger and the judgment of the Lord had come upon the people. Do you agree that we as Americans have transgressed against God? Let me see the hands of those that believe that we are terribly violated the laws of God. How is it then if we have transgressed and did all kind of things and have rejected God, how did it, how do you think that we're going to sit back and not be judged eventually? We're living in that time. And verse 11 says, and I will punish the world for their what evil and the wicked for their iniquity and I will cause the agonies, arrogancy, excuse me, arrogancy, arrogancy of of the pride to cease and will lay low the hardness of the terrible. God is saying those that are arrogant, those that are, that are wicked, those that are evil, those that are pride, prideful. He says, I am going to bring judgment upon such people. I was listening to the news on last week and it was talking about how if you go online to buy a stock, that there is a system that they have in place that somebody buys it before you do for a certain price. And when, they, when you go to buy it, as soon as, you, as soon as you log in to buy it and press the button to buy the stock, somebody else got a head start on you. They have a system in place that give them a few minutes, a few seconds advantage on you, and they buy up the stock, and then what they do, they sell it for you for increase. This is what's going on. I'm saying the greed of man is great in the earth. It's hard to find anybody's in service that is honest. 
Everybody's looking for a loophole on trying to take advantage of the customers. We're living in that time when you got to pray about getting any type of service because you don't know who it is that you're going to have working for you. Amen. And I'm saying this because God is bringing judgment. Let's turn to the book of Joel. Now we have read this scripture and it was also quoted by the apostle Peter during the time of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Let's read it in Joel. Now this is actually second chapter of Joel. And we're going to, to expedite time, we're going to start at verse 28. His actually Joel, the second chapter, verses 30, 23 through 32. But let's look at it. Let's just start at Joel, the 20, uh, verse 28. Read it. God is giving a prophecy years in advance about what he was going to do in the last days. He was going to pour out his spirit upon all people. Prior to this time, the Holy Ghost, we weren't privy to the Holy Spirit. Only those, meaning society in general, only those that God had called and ordained had access to the movement of the spirit in their lives. Amen. Now we find out that the Holy Ghost is going to be accessible to everyone. And so the prophecy is given by Joel that in these days, this is what's going to take place. Oftentimes we speak about the outpouring of the Holy Ghost and we stop at a certain point I'm going to point to today and we do not go to the whole context of the statement. Here it is though in his context. He says he will pull out. Amen. He said, and it shall come to pass after this that I will pour out of my spirit upon what all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see vision. Also upon your servants and also upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out of my spirit. And that's where we usually stop. We usually stop there and we we put emphasis upon the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as it was in the day of Pentecost. We're going to read in a, in a few minutes when this was actually fulfilled in the book of Acts. But let's look at the total context of it. Read on. He says he's going to show signs in the heavens that there will be terrible things coming up on the earth. Amen? But we never read this in context without pouring of the Holy Spirit. You don't hear too many people speak about this in the context on the day of Pentecost. But it's there in Scripture. He says, this is what I'm going to do. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered or saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be what deliverance as the Lord has said. And in the remnant who the Lord shall call. He's saying in spite of all this that he will have salvation for those that are looking for it. There is a requirement however the people of God, and we're going to re recap that in a few minutes. Whenever the blood moves and the sun was, was, was a sign in the heavens, there's always been judgment connected to judgment. And I want us to see that. Let's go to the next scripture. Are y'all with me?
Luke the 12th, Luke, St. Luke the 21st chapter, verses 25 through 36. <coughs> There's another sign. Let's read. Are we living in that time when nations are perplexed? They don't even know what to do with Russia. They're trying to put some sort of, what we call it, sanctions against Russia, but we're not going to do trade with you because you're a bad boy. They don't care. They already got what they wanted. They wanted to invade and take property, take land that wasn't their own. They want to be in a position to protect themselves, they think, from invasion. All right. So he says nations are going to be perplexed in the seas, in the waves, all kind of weather patterns. And look what it says in verse 26. Are y'all following me? Men's hearts failing or having hard conditions. Why? Because of fear. All kind of fear. Not just fear about this. There were so many people afraid that, that when they get out of college, they're not going to find a job. There were those of you that are afraid concerning your relationship with your children, where your children are, what they're doing. What about your marriage? There were some of you afraid of your marriage, afraid of relationships, afraid of sickness that had come upon you. There's all kind of fear in addition to the fear of judgment. So God is saying in his last day that people's heart will be failing them because of fear. But God has not given us the spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. He said there is still hope for my people. He wants you and I to walk in faith and have hope in who he is and what he has promised us. So this ought not to apply to us, but it will if we don't stay under the blood. <coughs> Read on. He said, when this all begins to take place, after this is over, we're going to see the Lord coming in the clouds with great glory. Amen? And when these things begin to come to pass, we're to do what? Look up. Lift up your heads for what? Your redemption draw it nigh. We don't believe that. Our redemption draw it nigh. Read on. Verse 29. <laughs> if you start to look at the flowers and the trees, they are beginning to do what? show buds. Amen? Begin to bud. And you yourself will look at that and say what? It's spring. God said, you can discern by signs. Is this what he said? Can't you tell that, that, that summer is nigh when you see the tree budding? So this is a sign to the time. He said, also when you see these things that began to take place. He said, I'm coming. But we still sit around and just full of so much insecurity that we can't walk in the fullness of God's promises towards us. We're always in a dilemma of some sort. So you know, when they now shoot forth, you see and you know of your own self that summer is nigh at hand. Read verse 30 through 31. 31. <clears throat> Now look what he's saying. He said, here is the warning. He said, when you see these signs, <clears throat> take heed to yourself, at least at any time 
your heart be overcharged with fighting. And with drunkenness, and the one that I wanted you to underline, the cares of life. Amen? The what? The cares. Our hearts is so full of things that, that is, we're responsible for. Things that are pulling and tugging at us, keeping us so preoccupied till we're going to forget to give God his first. He said, you can be occupied with what? The cares of life. It doesn't mean that you're out there sinning. Not the sinning of uh, 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 committing. But the lack of devotion, the lack of uh, maintaining. Because you're so busy. Why are we so busy? I believe in many cases we're busy because we can't trust God to help us. So we got to do it ourselves. The cares of life. He promised. He promised to take care of you. Can you believe that God is going to take care of you? Let me see the hands that can believe that. Well, if you believe that he's going to take care of you, he don't want you to be paralyzed with fear. Wow. And I know some of you are right in the midst of some terrible things. But you still are not to fear. Amen. He says the cares of life. And so that that day come what, church? Unaware. It comes what? Speak out. It comes how? Unaware. So I believe, according to scripture here, that when the day of the Lord come, when God began to do things in earth and judgment began to fall, that most of us won't be aware of it. It's our responsibility to sound the alarm for the people of God because during this time is going to be our greatest hour. Folks are going to be running to and fro, trying to find hope, trying to find an answer for what's going on. Their lives are going to be turned upside down and they're going to be going all kind of crisis. And they're going to be looking, knocking on your door, trying to find out, can you help me? You heard what the Lord saying, those that call on the name of Jesus shall be saved. But somebody got to bring them to that name. I believe we're in training right now. Preparation for what God is getting ready to do. There's a lot of discouraged people out there. They don't know what to do with their lives. But how many have found hope? And you're just doing fine in Jesus right now. You ain't got a whole bunch of money, but you're doing fine. Now, I'm not talking about all y'all. I'm talking about me. I ain't got a whole bunch of money. Amen. I know you got some rich folk up in here. But I, I'm doing well. It's not about money. Life does not consist of abundance of things in which a person possesses. You're not living by owning stuff. You're living by being in Christ. I'm happy in Christ, just where I am. Bless his name. Amen. He said that day can come up on you unaware. It's going, for as a snare shall it come on what? All them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Trouble is coming to what? The whole earth. This is what he said. Amen. And I think a lot of people has a misconception about the rapture. They just think that they're not going to go through anything and go exit out of here. The Lord is going to blow the trumpet and the angels are going to sound the trumpet and wham, are we gone? It's not going to happen that way. There is going to be trials and tests that we got to go through. We have to make ourselves ready.